are joining virtually or if you're here in the congregation, you are welcome at St. John's United Church of Christ. I thank you all for wearing your masks. They are required again now in this building. And at the end of the service, uh, the ushers will dismiss you. Please wait for them to do so. Uh, and I'll be waiting outside to help the flow to the outside instead of congregating uh, inside in the narthex. I bring you greetings from Larry and Thelma. They now live in the Sarah community and said to tell you that they miss you all very much. You'll notice in your announcements, um, there is a page about the festival of sharing, the back page, and how to set up a box um, of whichever one you might choose and bring it in. And there are some empty boxes by the display in the narthex. And so if you need something to put it in, you can um, pick it up there and take it with you. Helen, would you come up and um, come to a microphone and tell us about this visioning? We've gotten letters on it, but you know, what is it? Hi, everybody. So I did want to talk to you today about the letter you all have received about what I call the visioning process. Your council has discussed and worked on this for many months listen to a couple of presentations from outside organizations that work with churches, and decided on the ACC Church Building and Loan Fund with Jill White. And no, I assure you, we aren't starting a new building, and no, we aren't meeting alone. This is just where they put Jill's group, because some churches do need these things, so it made sense for them to put the group under this category. We have decided to take a step like this. We thought it was necessary at this critical for our church. Over the last several years, our church has experienced some events that have impacted us greatly. The debate over open and affirming, not having a settled pastor, and of course the COVID pandemic that we are still living through. Council thought this was the time to do some self-reflection as a church. These sessions are designed to help us identify where we want to go as a church. What are the ways we want to follow our fellow man as we honor and follow in God's teachings. We would like everyone's ideas and input, as this is your church, and all should have a say in its future. By going through this step-by-step -step process, it will also help identify for us a strategic plan for the next five years. Then, as we look forward in the next year, when we start looking for a settled pastor, we will have already determined our goals. And ultimately, this will help us select a pastor that would align with those goals and therefore be a good fit for St. John's. So once again, I can't stress enough the importance of participation. Um, please start by clicking on one of the first three sessions. It's as easy as sitting comfortably in a chair at home, clicking on the link for the Zoom session at the designated time, and you're on your way. You don't even need to have to leave. The link is in the weekly news notes, and it's about halfway down on the first page. And you just click on the link. If you don't get the um, weekly news notes, you can call the office and the link will be emailed to you. Or if you don't have internet, you can still participate by calling into the number provided in the link and participate over the phone. Um, Again, I can't stress the importance of everybody's participation. We want as much input as possible. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those after our service or give me a call. And thank you so much for your time and see you in the Zoom session. Thank you. Thank you. When we begin worship, um, the first hymn that we'll come to is brand new to you, I understand. And um, the words to it are not in your bulletin, so you'll need your hymn books. So to get acquainted with it, I invite you to open your hymn book now uh, to number 490. It's entitled, Sister, Let Me Be Your Servant. Ruth is going to play it through once, and then we'll sing the first verse now for practice. And um, then it will seem familiar to you when we come to that in the service.
hearts and minds for the worship of God. children to retell our sacred stories as they grow. We are the church together. We depend on our youth and young adults to ask us why we are doing things this way and suggest something new. We, we are the church together. We need each other to be the church. We, we are the church together. together. Let us pray. God of majesty and power, May our time of worship together turn this day into a holy day. Help us set aside our daily preoccupations so that our prayers can be earnest and our worship be alive and life changing. Amen.
right relationship with God and with our community. Creator of us all, we sometimes forget. We forget that we are not alone. We forget that you made us. We forget that we have had help along the way. We forget to ask for what we need. Embodied God, remind us that we are surrounded. We are surrounded by the people you have created and by the many gifts you have given them to share. Remind us of our own gifts and the ways we may use them in community. We confess that in our own struggle to survive, we have ignored other communities. We have forgotten that they too have the right to survive. Make us mindful, make us compassionate, Help us to see you in one another. In your name we pray. Amen. Beloved in Christ, know that you are God's own and that through God's divine love you are free to begin anew. The work of relationship with God and the work of living together in compassionate community. Amen. I invite you now to see who with you forms the body of Christ. Who is here today? Keeping in mind the people that are watching from at home, let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you all.
friends here today would invite you to come forward and join us. And to our young friends at home, I would say good morning and welcome. So, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I said there was something important that I wanted you to remember. And I hope you did, but just in case you didn't, I'm going to remind you that important thing. One of the most important things we can learn at church, and that is that God loves you. God loves you so much that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less, right? Okay, I said that. Okay, so I don't know if you've been thinking about that or not, but to me, I have to think about that. So, what does it mean that I can't do anything to change God's love, either good or bad? I wonder how that works. So I'm going to tell you another really important thing that you need to remember about God's love. And here it is. God's love is a gift. So it's a gift. It's just given to us. We don't do anything to earn it. It's just there for us. So that's really important to remember. But what do we do when we get a gift? What do you do, Quentin? You'd be grateful. I like that answer. And so, do you say something to the person who gave you the gift? What do you say? Thank you. Right. And we can do that with God, too, can't we? Can't we say prayers and thank God for God's love? Sure, we did that last Sunday, even, or a couple Sundays ago, even. Yeah, so we can remember to pray and thank God for all of the things that God does in our lives. So that's a good thing to do. But I thought about that for a while, and I just wondered if there was something else, another way we could show God that we're grateful for God's free gift of love, right? Well, I'm always interested to know what Jesus thinks about things, because Jesus is the expert. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know what, in the Gospel of Matthew, somebody asked Jesus one time, what is the greatest commandment? So that's kind of like saying, what is the thing God would like us to do the most, right? Probably? Okay. Here's what Jesus said, and listen, because this is important. Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he said, to make it more complicated, you should love your neighbor as yourself. So do you think, I'm wondering, and I wonder what you think, is that a way we say thank you to God? Yeah, I think so too. So how do we show love for God besides our prayers saying thank you? Are there other things we can do? What do you think? Maybe come to worship? to Sunday school, read the Bible, those things work. I think they work too. I think when we come to worship and we worship together, that's a way to say thank you to God. Right. When we read the Bible, when we sing, when we play beautiful music, those are all ways we're thanking God for God's free gift of love. But there's a second part of that, and that's the part we have to remember too. We have to show love to our neighbor. And I bet you can think of ways we do that, right? What are some ways? Give them gifts, right. Well, what about being kind? Can you being kind, being helpful, right? Being respectful, especially with people that are different from us. Sometimes that gets hard, doesn't it? Yeah, so I think we all know lots of ways we can show love to our neighbor by helping those who need things, by helping people who need help, like maybe getting up the steps or whatever. Right? Yeah, so sometimes we help people by giving things. Sometimes we help people by doing things. Sometimes we help people just by listening, just by being there. Right, and those are all things that make God happy. Right? So this morning, I think, we're going to hear a story from the Old Testament about a young girl named Esther. And Esther, in this story, Pastor Elise is going to tell us what she does that's very brave. And I think 
her very brave act was also a way to thank God, right? Okay, so this week, what I want you to think about are all the ways that you can thank God for this great, great gift of God's love that we can't mess up. Okay? All right, let's pray together. Do it, let's do an echo prayer. You say with me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to show your love to the world. Let's now listen for the word of God from our scripture lessons for today. The first one is Psalm 124. If it had not been the God who, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked. Then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torment would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their keep. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The state is broken, or the snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And we also read about Esther, the brave young girl just mentioned. This is from the book of Esther in chapters 7 and 9. So the king and Haman went to feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition? Queen Esther. It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me, that is my petition, and the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for the damage to the king. Then the king Asherudius said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Hanan. Then Hanan was terrified before the king and the queen. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Hanon's house, fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on it, on that, so that they so they hang Haman on the gallows. 
that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king was abated. Mordecai retorted these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Aharuius, near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day of the same month, year by year, as the days for which the Jews gain relief from their enemies. And on the month that has been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning, in, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food to one another, and presents to the poor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. There are some great action stories in the Bible. For instance, Joseph, you may remember his story. He was the favored son of Jacob, and so Jacob gave him a very special coat, and all of this led uh, his brothers, Joseph's brothers, to be very jealous of him. So his brothers sought to kill him. Instead, they ended up selling him into slavery. Joseph went to Egypt, spent some time in prison, interpreted dreams, and eventually ended up second in command of the country. Another great story is David, who killed Goliath, escaped Saul, and eventually became king. Then he saw Bathsheba bathing, and he wanted to marry her. To do that, he had to get rid of her husband, and so he arranged for the husband to be killed in battle. There are a lot more details to the story, which make it pretty juicy. It's really a story should be rated R. <laughs> but like a lot of our modern stories and movies, most of the adventure stories in the Bible feature men as the main character and certainly as the hero of the story. Think of Joseph, also Moses, Joshua, Jacob, Solomon, Samuel, in the book of Judges, there was Ruth. She was one of the judge, not sorry, the, was Deborah. Deborah was one of the judges, and she led the Israelites into battle. She is an exception to that, although her story is pretty short. There are other women in the Bible, but they are seldom portrayed as the heroes. So today we come to the story of Esther. It also is a great action story. It has everything in it. A royal court in a foreign land with intrigue and spies, scandal, battles, revenge. It's a story of courage and victory, and the hero is a woman. Esther was a very beautiful young woman who married the Gentile king of Persia around 450 BC. She didn't seem as far as we can tell from the writings in that book, she didn't seem to practice her religion very much. She went to live in the king's harem. It's not a girl that most Jewish mothers would recommend to their daughters as role models. Yet, there she is in the Bible of the Jews and in our Christian Bible as well. It's not a long book. Take about an hour and read the whole thing one of these days because it's a great story. It begins with a scandal involving Vashti, who was then the wife of King Assyrius. That was an awful scandal, really. The king told her to put on her crown and come out to a party that he was throwing for a bunch of the bigwigs in his kingdom, men, of course. She was a trophy wife, and he wanted to show her off, and Queen Vashti said no. The king was enraged, and part of the problem, see, was that he and all of his cronies feared that she was setting an example to all the wives of the kingdom, and pretty soon they might all feel free to say no when their husbands told them to do something. 
and that would be terrible. Queen Vashti was never to come before the king again, and so the king looked for a new wife to replace her. They had kind of a beauty contest to see which one he would want. Mordecai was an influential man in the kingdom. He brought Esther, who was his adopted daughter, into the palace to put her into the competition, but warned her not to mention that she was Jewish. When she was brought before the king, he saw her beauty, and it says he loved her above all women. So he gave her a royal crown and gave her the place that Queen Vashti had had. Now, like any good story, this one also has a villain. And in Jewish families, when they tell the story of Esther, they have a lot of fun. Anytime Haman, the villain, is mentioned, everybody goes, boo. And every time you mention Mordecai or Esther, the heroes, everybody goes, hooray. So there was this powerful man, man named Haman. Boo. boo. Haman was angry when Mordecai Yay. refused to bow down to him, and he knew that Mordecai was Jewish. So he managed to convince the king that they needed to execute Mordecai and annihilate all the Jews. Mordecai went to Esther and said, you need to go to the king and save your people. But the way it worked there in those days, when was that if one of the women went in front of the king without being invited, she would be killed. So Esther reminded Mordecai of that risk. Mordecai told her she needed to do this. Told her that she would suffer along with all of the Jewish people if she didn't do something. Esther should use her influence with the king to save her people. And back in the fourth chapter, not what we read today, Mordecai took all of this to Esther and said to her, Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. In the part of the scripture that Mark read for us this morning, Esther managed to come before the king, and he, she cleverly plotted it along until she had that chance to be with him and give the request. She also expla explained that Haman was the real villain of the story, so the gallows that had been built for Mordecai were used to hang Haman. Now the law said that Jewish people were to be rounded up and executed, but with Esther's influence, she managed to get the king to rescind that. And the king wrote a letter allowing the Jewish people to defend their lives. So the Jewish people there then took that as permission and they exacted revenge. And that gives you the big battle scene that I mentioned. And to celebrate all of this, then there was a great feast and it established the holiday called Purim, which is still celebrated today which is when they tell that great story. It is a great story. It was even made into a movie. Um, I haven't seen it. You'll have to go back and look for a movie titled The Book of Esther. But the fact that the story is about a woman and that actually in the whole book of Esther, God is not mentioned, makes one wonder how it did get into the Bible. So, and also there was a great absence of any religious practices. It doesn't mention going through any of the rituals of the Jewish people. There was one time mentioned in there when Esther asked for the people to fast for her before she appears before the king. My guess is that that was a request for prayer, but it doesn't tell us that. So here's a possible reason why Esther was included in the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures. And within that answer, we will also find some resources for our lives today. When Esther was written, the Jews were not living in their homeland. They were dispersed. This is called the story of the diaspora. They were living in exile. 
they had been taken to Persia. This being true, the question for the exiled Jew was, how do I live as a Jew away from the temple, away from my homeland, away from my people? And Esther offers some insight. The purpose of Esther's story is to remind the post-exilic Jews that one can prosper in a foreign land as an exile without giving up their identity as a Jew. So in other words, Esther's story is to say, if she can do it, you can too. There were many forces positioned against her. First, of course, was that she was a woman, and as such, she was essentially powerless, and she was marginalized. As a female, even if she had wanted to, she would not be able to seek power in this male-dominated culture. And in that respect, she is like the Jewish people in many times and places, marginalized, disenfranchised, without power or the means of gaining power. But Esther, by winning that beauty contest, but by being very smart and very courageous, saves her people. And in doing so, she demonstrates to Jewish exiles that they too can not only survive, but thrive if they are courageous and fight the obstacles. The exiles also learn from Esther that they don't need to be conspicuously religious in order to survive in a foreign country. God is not mentioned, religious practices are not mentioned, but Esther is Jewish, and deep down she knows who she is in relationship to the people and to God. When it comes to a crisis, she knows where her loyalty should lie. She doesn't have to give a statement of beliefs, and she doesn't have to observe the rituals, but she knows who she is and whose she is. The message to the exiles who cannot worship in the temple and must live among people who don't believe in God is that they can still retain that sense of who they are. Still, all of this may have us asking, so what? It's a great story, it's got a good plot, but what's in it for me? So here are some things that Esther can tell us things that are relevant to the way we live. First, it tells us something about our relationship to the world. Most of us are not first-generation immigrants or exiles in the sense that we have had to leave our homeland and expect our new host country to be a permanent home. But as Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, we are to be in the world, but not a part of it. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God. We have been called resident aliens. We are Christians of 2021 who live in this world, but apart from some of the standards of society. In the midst of hate, greed, lack of caring for fellow humans, we seek to follow Jesus and to love one another. But Esther reminds us that it is possible to live as a Christian in times that are unfavorable to believers and followers of Jesus. Like Esther, we too have been unable to attend worship in much of 2020 and 2021. But the closing of church doors that the pandemic did did not spell the end of the church, even though some thought it would. We adapted with workarounds by staying at home and tuning in online, for example. We helped our children with distance learning. We learned how to worship virtually and study the Bible with online groups. The sexual misconduct of some Christian leaders brought contempt for churches and the people who attend them, but it did not bring down the church, and it has not dampened the faith of believers. Even though there are more unchurched people now than ever before, the church 
survives, and the needy and the oppressed are lifted up. Like Esther, we are encouraged to challenge authorities, to speak truth to power, and to take risks. Like Esther, we can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in spite of obstacles that are set before us. She used what she had, and it brought down her enemies and saved her people. We are living in difficult times, a pandemic, political divisiveness, racial conflict, conflict, climate change, but there is no need to feel hopeless. Each one of us has a role in bringing about God's kingdom on earth. As Mordecai said to Esther, who knows, perhaps you have come to be here for just such a time as this. Like Esther, we can find a way to be victorious in spite of the pandemic, however nasty the culture wars, despite the fluctuations in the economy, despite problems in our host country. Even when God appears to hide his divine presence from human view, we know, as Esther knew, that God stands beside us and never leaves us. Like Esther, we face obstacles, and sometimes it seems like an uphill battle. And yet, who knows? Perhaps we have come to this place, to this moment, to these people, to this challenge, for just such a time as this. is take my life and let it be. Let's join our hearts in a time of prayer. Oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life, bringing hope out of despair and growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit, that we may know the joy you give your people. 
This morning we pray for others we know and love, those who are ill, are lonely, are mourning, those who are far from home. We pray especially for Shirley, Larry, AJ, and Grace. We pray for people in this country and around the world, especially remembering Puerto Rico this morning as they have been dealing with hurricane winds, rain, and earthquakes. May the guidance and counsel of the Holy Spirit allow them and us to see that amid what we may consider chaos, you, O oh God, make order and peace. Let's pray together now the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. that God is with us and among us. Thinking of our gifts, let's dedicate them as we praise God. Will you stand, if you are able, as we sing the doxology and then pray together.
add verses to this song. What else are we going to do so that God can use me? We can work and pray and sing. And what's another word? What else can we do? Love. Love. Okay, let's sing a verse with love.